All right, team, three, two, one, we are recording. So um, I, I do want to call out with this particular webinar, the way I've, I've designed it is it's not just about collaboration. I'm specifically focusing on cross-functional collaboration. So where you work across, not just collaborating and teaming in your own silo, but how you start to do that across other silos, both within your department or function, and then even more importantly, you know, externally. Now, externally could just mean other functions within your own company. So particularly where you're in a larger organization, let's say you belong to the finance function. So there's cross-functional within finance. So you might be in treasury and someone else might be in accounts payable or in, you know, investments and, and you, you are um, working across the boundaries with them. But it could also be that um, you start collaborating externally, which is, where you start working with people in sales or in customer service or in human resources. And that, that's like the external, but you can go one step further, which is, and we, this is my dream to one day be able to do this, where we, where we get people collaborating with their customers cross-functionally or with external stakeholders cross-functionally. Um, I've already had situations, I have a client in the UK who are um, like a supplier to a client of ours in Silicon Valley, and they didn't know that both of them spoke ID. And the minute we mentioned that to them, it just created a bond and a way things were. So they are one of the first I'll see where they're starting to look at how they um, bring people together from both companies to, to accelerate that collaboration. But that's what I'm getting at today is this cross-functional piece. Um, let me just share some slides to go through our normal sort of protocol here of showing you who's who in the zoo. All right, so today you can see we're focusing on cross-functional team and collaboration. I put here 10X because people think that using the ID within a team is really valuable and, and game-changing. Honestly, the difference when you start using it cross-functionally is out of this world. I'm st absolutely stunned at the difference and the amount of untapped potential that lies across an organization as opposed to vertically down within an organization. And I put 10X to let you know that the, the phenomenal untapped potential there is like orders of magnitude beyond working functionally. If, if leaders truly understood the cross-functional potential, they would, they would move straight to that rather than worrying about getting their own functional teams in place. Now, you do have to do that first as like groundwork, but most, most leaders stop at getting the, their functional teams working well and then move on to other strategic things. Um, after today, you might have a better insight uh, into how you could maybe accelerate that cross-functional piece. All right, so here's our culture. This is the culture today. Um, I think those of you who have been on these calls regularly won't, be, won't see any surprise to see. We generally tend to, because most of our people are business leaders, and that brings, particularly in, in technology firms um, and engineering firms and those that are sort of more in the sciences, tend to be strong in the verify drive. It's no surprise that when you look at the dominance here, it's the verify and, um, you know, as the stronger drive. Here's what it's been the last few weeks. So you can see it doesn't move a whole lot. We did have a couple of weeks ago, it was sort of a little more even. Last week was a little bit more on the verify, avoid, improvise, and this week we pulled back a little bit. Um, I would suspect that as we expand the audience, both across industry and larger numbers, you'll see it come up more across the middle. That was my experience when I was actually validating the ID. I had to find populations that were more um, a sample size from right across all four instincts. And it was challenging because you go to most industries, if you said, well, let's go and I've, I've got, you know, I've got a good network with the accounting industry. Let's go and validate through the accounting industry. You're actually validating against one style of ID, which is, you know, 84% were verifiers, avoid improvise. So finding that balance is challenging, but um, maybe our own database now is uh, getting closer to that. Okay, so let's move into this. So when you look at, um, you know, I'm just to put this sort of in a visual, I, I say most people with building teams focus on the formation and support stages. So they establish and build their team, and then they focus on getting them to deliver whatever the, the value proposition is, or the promises, or the you know, service level agreements or um, their QBRs or whatever their particular objectives are, focusing on delivering those is really where they get pretty much all consumed. The area of what could we start to do across the business and then what could we start to do even external to our own function or external yet again with customers is the great uncharted territory 
um, that that awaits us for collaboration. And, and I want to start exploring with you um, some of the work we've already done and some best practices that, you, that might give you some clues to start there, um, you know, if, if you're not already moving in that, in that direction. So what I thought I'd show you first is the org structure design. Now, I know there are some people that say, well, I do it as a, from the circle, you know, in the middle of a circle from the center and go out. They don't like to think of themselves as a CEO who's on top of everybody. But if you think of most org, you know, designs and, and organizational charts that you see, you have a, a leader at the top and then you have a bunch of people leaders who report to that person. And then you have a whole bunch of silos, um, like separate departments that report up to those people leaders. That generally is the org structure that's in our, you know, commercial world today. Someone said to me a couple of years ago, do you know where that structure came from? I'm like, not really. You know, have you ever thought about where that structure comes from? Does anyone have any clue on why, why do we structure our businesses this way? Take yourself off mute if you want to share. It predominantly comes from the military. There you go. Okay, Kate, just let that, uh, let's put that in chat, Paul. Oh, okay, military. great. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so if it came from the military, and yet most of us say we, we don't want to be command and control, we don't want to be directive, we want to be, you know, a, a collegiate, collaborative style of leadership and so on. Why are we using a military org structure? It sort of is interesting, isn't it? So I, when I heard that, I'm like, hmm, that's interesting that we've just sort of evolved into that, maybe because we, we didn't have a different direction to guide us. But, you know, for the few people that think about being cross-functional or set up cross-functional initiatives, it, they tend to come after we've got the silos in place. So we get all of our functions working well, and then we aspire to have some cross-functional collaboration, but it's generally a secondary thought. And what I would say to you is that's right from the get-go, that's what causes failure with cross-functional collaboration. So if we're going to collaborate effectively, we need a different mindset, let alone a different structure. So I want to start with the mindset. And if I could give it to you in simple terms, this is the mindset. Put cross-functional first. Think about the cross-functional initiatives first. Now, you can't actually do them first, but if you think of, okay, where, you know, if you go and build a house and you put the foundations in place, you don't think the house is built when you've got the foundations in place. You just have done the foundations and then you get into building the house, but you don't stop at the foundations. The same is true for how we need to build out organizations. You do need to get your functions set up and in place first, just as a foundational mechanism to allow you to then do the cross-functional work, which is what we'll explore later today. And then once you get the internal cross-functional teams working well, you can start to think about how you do that externally and because that's where the even larger value proposition is, if it was like, let's just for the sake of this discussion, say it's 20x value when you work externally, 10x the value when you work internally and 1x when you work in silos, why wouldn't we be gunning for the external cross-functional piece? You know, we have to do it more from the, from the ground up here. But in terms of how we think, the mindset would be that once we've got ourselves set up, we've got our external cross-functional teams and leaders in place first, then we've got our internal, then we've got our silos. The silos support everything we're doing above. And I think bringing that into play mentally is the first important shift. Now, I just used an example here of, um, it just so happens that we, you know, have a number of engagements in flight on um, uh, sales operations outfits, so strategic sales operations and engagement, and enablement, I'm sorry. And I just grabbed one that we've been working with recently um, and anonymized it. So, you know, it protects that client. But this is something we're building with that particular client. So they were very internally focused in their silos. And as we expanded and thought about the external people, there were, there were some of those little circles they didn't even think of as their stakeholder communities. And it was only because we're working with some of those people that we realized there were these linkages and we brought them into the mix. So just even building out an inventory of, so who are these people that we need to be, just that awareness can be really insightful. But that would be the first thing I would say to you is, there's a need 
to shift the mindset and have this style of thinking. And whether you build it from the top down, like you, you know, from whether you um, draw it, I should say, from the top down, um, or whether you build it sideways or build it from as circles, you know, concentric circles out. What I'm saying to you is ultimately you want to you want to think of it as um, the the cross functional collaboration teams and initiatives are the more significant components. And I do think that if you think of it in terms of the value proposition of 20x, 10x, and 1x, that's probably the right way to be thinking about how you drive this forward. And I'm I'm not here to prove to you that it is 20x or 10x. Um, it might be 30x. Uh, it might be 5x. Uh, what I can tell you is, for anecdotally, what I've experienced, it's phenomenally more than what you can accomplish in a silo. No matter how well you get the silos working. Any questions or comments that people have as a reaction to what I've shared so far? Hey, Paul, it's Grant. How are you going? Good, Grant. Thank you. Um, just have you got any examples of um, cross-functional organisational designs from, from organisations? I'm just super curious as to what they might look like on a sheet of paper. No, no. Uh, so what I find interesting is when you actually say to, to leaders, so who's had, exp so this is, I've probably been on this bandwagon for like the last year, and I've said to them, so who's got a cross-functional org design? I haven't had anybody give me one. What I've had come up are that the, the, the most common cross-functional initiatives are probably sales kickoff meetings, you know, because that's where they tend to work um, not just the sales organization, but they'll often engage a whole lot of other people. But that's an event um, that they populate. But if you think about it, that type of initiative has incredible um, intention around it. And, and it's got an annual sort of um, cycle of how things go. So it's got almost the same rhythm, the operating rhythm, as you would a vertical, you know. Um, and then on top of that, you get cross-functional initiatives that come about with things like acquisition integration. So they'll form an integration team. and th But that has a limited life. And to be honest, it just tends to have a, you know, once they get over a certain hump, then it loses a lot of its momentum. And, and I watch a lot of integrations, I would call them failures in terms of exploiting the full potential. They tend to almost rape and pillage what they've bought uh, to the point where the people who have bought go, why did you buy us? I mean, we're no longer in the in the same shape that we're in at the time. So I've, I've not seen yet a cross-functional org structure other than I've seen some leaders set up cross-functional initiatives and they've done the initial work to populate them. But then once people move, like if that leader gets promoted or moved somewhere else, those initiatives run out of steam because they're seen as the brainchild of that one person. And then they, they basically evaporate with when that person leaves. So having a solidified structure that has a sustainable lifetime to it, I have not seen that yet. And I think it's the great untapped potential in business. Look at what's happening now with the coronavirus, how we've all gone, oh my God, we can work virtually. You know, um, it's possible that there are, I, I do believe we'll swing back to a hybrid style, but I already know clients that are scaling down their physical office requirements because they can see that they don't need to have a seat for everybody. And more the point, everyone won't want to return to those same seats five days a week. <clears throat> so there is a shift that's occurring. And as people become more used to working virtually, what that's going to do is say, well, okay, we don't even need to populate our teams from by people who are local. We can start to think more broadly. And I think it will start to whet the appetite for much more cross-functional opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd, I'd really like to drive this um, thought leadership, you know, around this um, topic. Yeah, thank you. It's interesting now, isn't it? Like it's for all that leaders bang on about collaboration and cross-functional collaboration and, and the, the interdependencies um, and synergies are really obvious. They don't exploit it. Like even with acquisition integration, I hear leaders talking about we've got to extract the synergies. But, but when you tap into what they mean, they mean the, the economics, the financial synergies. They don't mean the talent synergies and the, and the true business synergies. Um, I find that really interesting. They just mean cost savings from economies of scale, you know. Um, it's very, very small-minded to me. Yeah. Okay. So um, 
I just put this up as a model. So that, that council is just a way of linking, you know, an external world like the, the broader, in this case, the SSOE communities, because those leaders won't want to be beholden to the people leaders that are under the main leader. So my suggestion was to set up a council um, that was a, had you know representation from both parties to help sort of executive lead um, this these set of initiatives, um, and this is all underway right now with the, you know um, one of our larger clients. So um, let's just keep moving. So the three prerequisites for collaboration: trust, alignment, and common language. So leaders who have driven uh, transformation, not collaboration, but transformation, would would already agree with this with the, these statements. I have, a, I have a mantra that trust for teams is like oxygen for humans. Without it, you just can't function. Trust is everything in an organization. And so you have to establish a, a foundation of trust. We'll talk about that a little more in a minute. Once you've got that trust and that awareness and that respect for the differences and people with a willingness to want to work together um, and, and don't sort of um, get distracted by the irritations that differences can cause, the next step is to get alignment of the work because most people, what I find staggering is even though people can work together and know each other's names and they'll know that so-and-so is in finance and so-and-so is in sales or, or we're, we're, we're both in sales. Um, and I know his title is, you know, this, this one of mine's a different title. If you said, what are you actually doing? What are you working on? What are your priorities? Most people in teams don't really know what each other is working on. And so getting an alignment of the work is nothing more complicated than just, you know, putting together what, what are each of our, if there's eight of us in a team, what are the five or six key priorities that we're currently working on? And if you wrote them all down, one each on a post-it note and stuck them all up on the wall, and I've done this many times, I'll guarantee you the amount of duplication is ridiculous. Like people have got, I put up something and say, I'm working on a new go to market protocol for X. And it's like, well, so am I, so am I, I didn't know you were doing that. And, and you know what happens then they go, we should talk. Oh, that's interesting. So now they're voluntarily saying we should collaborate until people have got a purpose for collaboration, particularly when you're wired as a verifier, verifiers are driven to be very siloed and territorial. Um, avoid verifiers are your natural collaborators. And so this, misalignment of work occurs when you've got strong verifier cultures, as you've seen with even what we've got on our group here today, people tend to focus on their thing. And they just, it's not because they don't want to collaborate. They're so consumed by their own territory and their own set of responsibilities. They haven't really looked up to say, what, what else is the rest of my colleagues working on? And maybe where are their opportunities either that are duplications or, or synergy. So getting alignment of work, is a massive driver towards collaboration and it's not complicated. You could do it in, you know, the, the exercise can take several hours, but to actually pull it out, you could just write, like each of us right now could write down within five minutes, what are the top five, six things we're working on, put them on post notes, flash them up on a wall or talk to them. And you don't have to even explain what they are. You just give the title and that's enough for people to realize there's a potential linkage there to something I'm working on and away you go. So um, there are a number of, you know, uh, techniques around doing that well, but essentially that's the alignment of work. You can't collaborate unless there's alignment. Otherwise, just everybody going off like scattered guns. And then the third piece that's becoming increasingly apparent is the need for a common language. Um, and by common language, you know, it's like a shared bond, a shared language, like a fabric that weaves people together so that one way or another, we all have a similar blood type. And what I would say to you is in the work that we do, there are four things coming up that become common language. I'll give you the example so you know what I'm talking about. The first one I've got is PPI. So that stands for Peak Performance Indicator. And those of you who have done work with, with the ID and, and with us especially would know we talk about on a scale of zero to 10, 10 being where you're really in stride, you're you know, true to your ID, you're flying, you're really at your best. And one being you're so demotivated, you can hardly get out, out of bed of the morning what's your number? Like today, if I do that for myself and I do this every day and I do it throughout the day, it's part of my mindset. If I said, what's my number today? I'm probably a nine. There's what nine comes up for me. So, but there might be other days where you go, well, I'm a four. And so this, what's your number becomes part of the common language. So in our clients, when we start a meeting, we just say, can we whip around the table and just find out what everyone's number is? And they know what we're talking about because it's a common language. 
and we'll just go around very quickly. So I'm a seven, I'm a six, I'm a five, I'm a, I'm a nine. And straight away, it gives you a sense of where the energy, where the morale uh, is in the room. You can, you can call it out and speak to it, but it's part of a common language. The same with the idea itself. When you can say, um, look, you know, I just have some questions to ask. It's not because I don't trust you guys. It's just me as a verifier. I, I, I just need to make sense of this. Or as an authenticator, I want to understand how this works. Or, you know, I'm asking these questions because as a completer, this doesn't resonate with what we spoke about last time. And I can't see how those two things fit together. So I'm just trying to understand how all this meshes together. Or as an improviser, I'm asking questions because, you know, I'm passionate about this topic and I want to be able to do a really impressive job but I need to know more in order to do that. And when you can just use the language of ID, it helps people understand where you're coming from. That's what we mean by common language. The assume positive intent is a protocol we, we put in place. It's one of our three trust protocols. If you want, we talk about a foundation of trust. You can't just have trust. You've got to have something like a table. You've got to have legs that hold the table up, trust being the table. The legs are the protocols. And one of those protocols is a commitment we have everyone make to assume positive intent. That's very different to giving people the benefit of the doubt. Um, if, you, if you think about that, the nuance is, um, sounds it's subtle, but it's profound in how it plays out. And that protocol, as I've mentioned on a previous webinar, is a game-changing protocol for how teams work together. And the last one is team one. When you, when you start to work with teams and cross-functionally, the question comes, so which team, which team do I really belong to? Do I belong to my peer team? Is it my team that I'm leading? Is it these cross-functional teams? Which team is the most sacred team and which team do I treat as team one? And so determining that in an organization, coming to agreement on that and saying, not only is this team one, but there are some sacred things about team one. Like when we say the customer comes first, if we have a customer visit, when we've got one of these team meetings, which comes first? And if it's team one, it's team one. So, you know, having that protocol um, understood and used as a vernacular in the business is all part of what we refer to as having common language that makes the business much more agile and able to work horizontally, not just vertically. And that's really one of the, you know, that's where you want to get to is, is not having the initial mindset that you have this, this horizontal approach and then having these sorts of prerequisites in place so you can then get um, effective when you when you move to the cross-functional piece. Any questions or comments? So put it in the chat if you do, and then Ian, I'll, when I do that, you might bring it to my attention because I my um, laptop's not coming up fast enough for me right now. Just bring it to my attention verbally. All right. So guys, I want to share this with you. This will this will show why we've got to get the the trust and the and the functional silo work in place first. Some of you may not have seen this chart before, but this chart speaks to the basic journey of all teams. So if you think of it from the left to the right, and I can explain this left to right and right to left, the journey of a team normally is the gray line, meaning you start, you form the team, the next default place is one of suspicion, not trust. As human beings, group dynamics take us to a place of suspicion by default not trust trust never ever occurs just by happenstance so i think that in itself is the first thing to you know that that when i realized that in my own work you know i don't know 10 years ago probably um that was like mind-blowing to me to realize that no matter how trusting and trustworthy each individual is when you put those 10 or whatever individuals into a team dynamic, the resulting um, you know, output of that equation of those 10 individuals is one of suspicion. So trust plus plus trust plus trust plus trust plus trust equals suspicion. I mean, that's just crazy. But if you, if you look at it's crazy from a mathematical point of view or a logical point of view, but when you actually observe team dynamics, I think most people's experience, you'd agree. Yep. It, it, people are, you know, skeptical of why where each person's coming from and then they make assumptions and which cause all sorts of misunderstandings and then that starts that leads to passive aggressive behavior because people don't feel confident to tackle people up front so then it starts to take them on that southward axis where you get misaligned you don't collaborate everyone works in their own silos you start having 
you know, work around solutions to things rather than working with the, the group. And it leads to failure. Now, that doesn't mean that the whole place blows up, but it certainly means that it's sub-optimized and that people have certain successes, but there's a bunch of things that don't succeed. Think about change and transformation. They say that 80% of change efforts fail, 80%. And yet we just get on with using the same change processes as are always used. And yet, as I've often said, if, if I was an investment manager and I said, you come and invest with me, 80% of the time I lose, but you know, I win 20% of the time, would you invest your money with me? You wouldn't do it. And yet we, we follow that same pattern for change and, and organizational design. What we have found is that unless a leader arrives at that pivot point place and says, you know, I want to build a high performance team or a high performance organization. And they start to apply real intention to that. The first thing they'll realize is that we need to have trust. And in order to have trust, we need something to build the trust. So most of them go to an offsite and they have a, you know, they do some type of exercise with a team building event or some type of bonding experience to actually bring about a cohesion of those people. Generally, it's short lived because it's an experience that works in the cocoon of the offsite. And when you go away and you start to do your real work back at, back at work, everything starts to unramble. And unless you've got a foundation of trust, something that's based on, which is why, which is where ID comes in, because ID helps you understand the very thing that erodes trust, which is when people feel their motives and values are questioned, that's what erodes trust. Um, the ID helps you understand people's motivations and values and the awareness of the differences. And that's why it's such a linchpin for building that foundation. Once you've got the foundation, you can have the tough conversations and it's the tough conversations uh, that are the key to effective collaboration. The mistake that a lot of teams make is because they get on well with each other over time, they actually have camaraderie. Camaraderie is not trust. And there's a lot of teams that when we point that particular, um, you know, principle out to them they go oh my god that's so true we, we all get on really well but we don't actually trust each other like if you measure trust by where do i go to when something goes wrong do i still trust you then do i assume positive intent which is not easy to do and that's why it's game changing um, but it always has profound effect it's like going to the gym it's not always easy to go to the gym and work out but it always feels good when you've done it same with assuming positive intent so if you, if you want to have the, the cross-functional collaboration, you first must have trust. And unless you're willing to put the work in, and it generally starts best in your own teams, that's why starting with your silos makes sense. But even when you build out your cross-functional teams, you still need to do the work to establish this foundation of trust. Otherwise, you won't be able to have the collaboration either internally or externally. Paul, just got a, got a question. Um, Basically, we all bring our own agendas into collaborative work. What have you discovered as best practice to leave our individual agendas at the door? Great question. So that that's one of the tough conversations that when you when you know um, you do have to end up with a common mission, common purpose, and and the trade off will be well, what about my agenda then? You know, and the, when when I actually studied collaboration and and I said to people, so you guys are collaborating really well together what's the what was the tipping point for that collaboration the answer and it was an answer was when we got to a point where we put our own agendas to one side and had a common agenda and so when we are driving this journey we know in the work we do we know we need to confront that and if we see people with separate agendas or they haven't had the discussion about a common agenda we know that part of that journey includes being able to have that conversation. That's one of the real conversations, Ian, that we have when we talk about, you know, the alignment of work, for example. People, when they see that and you say, we're going to have five or six key initiatives, they're like, well, what about my initiative? You know, what about this? And like, nope, we're agreeing that we're not going to have it. So if you go to someone like Amazon, one of their 14 leadership principles is disagree and commit, a, a phrase a lot of us have heard. And so that means, well, we're agreeing that my initiative isn't going to be an important one and I've got to let go of that and focus on something else. Yes, that's what that means. And if people aren't willing to do that, then that's okay, but they, they don't have a seat on the bus. I mean, it's gotta be that type of, that's what leadership is. You know, you, you do all you can to keep them on the bus and help their thinking shift to be aligned to the bus, 
But if they're not willing to go there, and there are times where people say, I, I can't, I don't believe in that, okay, then that doesn't fit anymore. And you've got to be able to call that. That's part of having those real conversations. The trade-off discussion, as we said, I think last week, is the determinant of when you're having a real conversation. Um, so it's a great question, and you've got to get aligned around the common purpose. I just, I want to call out here, if you look, um, one of the behaviours of trust is volunteerism and cross-representing each other. So meaning what happens when you start to see trust and people really get that we are rowing the boat in the same direction, we do have a common agenda. Because I'm not trying to do that, um, what do you call it, um, fight or flight or survival sort of instincts, people are willing to volunteer their time, their resources, their people, um, you know, that, that starts to come up much more free flowing when there is trust in each other. It's one of the, if you're not seeing volunteerism, you don't have trust. If you don't see people cross representing each other, um, so that, which that's not just trust, that's a result of alignment because once you're aligned and you can sort of say, oh, if you're working on that topic too, if you're going into that meeting, I'm happy for you to go there and not me, you know? Um, but cross representing each other is another outcome and another, another signal of really good trust. So cross-representing each other is one of the things that needs to happen when you are collaborating. You can't go to every single meeting or be on every single initiative. You've got to start trusting your colleagues to represent you. And so that's why I call out, this, this is where this, you can see how it starts to really fit. And I'll share these slides with you for however you might want to then share some of this thinking or even this material with what you're doing in driving transformations and leading teams. This is how it fits together. I thought I'd also share this with you. When we study high performance teams and look at what are the key indicators of high performance teams, we, I just circled the, the things that stand out relevant to today's discussion. That's not to say these three are more important than any of the others. They're just the pieces relevant to today. And I won't go through them all because that's not the topic of today. But you know, when teams are high performing, they not only do solve problems together, they want to solve problems together. They no longer do it on their own. They, they can see the synergistic value in reaching out and getting the expanded thinking of their colleagues. So there's a desire to spend their time together, not on QBRs and business updates, but on actually solving problems together. Um, they cross represent each other and you see the innovation. We see the volunteerism and because of the working together and the lateral thinking, you start to get a lot more innovation. So as you saw on this chart, uh, one of them is coming, no? Oh, I thought I had uh, effective collaboration. What also then happens is innovation. I thought I had innovation on there. Um, but innovation and collaboration pretty much go together. Oh, there it is, trust outcomes and the innovation. It's one of the things that occurs when you get more effective collaboration. So these, you know, if you're striving for innovation um, or you want to see these types of behaviours, they all come about um, naturally when you have a team that's really performing very well. And they are foundational ingredients before you can then start to have cross-functional work working well. So if I went into an organization today and said, um, let's optimize, I would know to go to the, to the cross-functional place, but before I can go there, I've got to get my teams working well. And, and these are the sorts of behaviors I want to see in order to make sure our cross-functional work is going to fly. But to get these, I know I need to have the awareness, the trust, the alignment, and you know, I use ID to do that. So that's how it all fits. But knowing that's the formula, I can do it in rapid time. You know, it's not the sort of thing that takes 12 to 18 months, as you heard last week in our call, that it typically takes. We'll get there in weeks. If we know what to do, we can get there in weeks. Like, if you gave me two months, we'd have this up and running. All right, let's talk about the framework for collaboration. I'm just zooming along because I'm aware of the time. The first one we've already covered, um, but I added the phrase. A lot of people say, well, I can't spend all my time on this because I have a day job to do. The day job, they think, is their vertical job, their silo. No, the day job has got to be both. It's not, it's not that it's horizontal instead of vertical. It's that both. And generally, the more senior you are, the reality is that it's about a 70 to 80% tilt. So it's 70 to 80% is horizontal and only 20% to 30% is vertical. That is a game-changing mindset shift for almost everybody that we encounter. The second is aligning the work and keeping it to just five to six key initiatives to get started. When I, if I heard that an organization had 40 initiatives, and I do hear that from time to time, I know that it's just set up for failure. 
that's no different to saying as a leader, you've got 40 direct reports. I mean, all of us know that the span of control of, of, that's at a best practice level is probably somewhere between about eight and 12. You know, there are times when you might have 18 for temporarily, or you might only have five because you're still building out. But, the, but the, the, the number generally is around that eight to 12 mark. The number of initiatives, particularly when you're getting up and running, and you know, to my conversation with Grant earlier, you don't see this very often anyway. But if you started with five to six, that would, that would be, and, and you hit them as a home run, that would be a great win. Um, but what that means is trade-off discussions, because you're not going to start with five to six initiatives. You're going to have people gunning for wanting, you know, 15, 16 or more initiatives, and you're going to have to have a very real conversation about which ones are we going to start with and which ones are we going to either not do at all or um, delay. That in itself, that conversation itself requires trust and good cohesion in the team. Okay, the third one is avoiding the bias to be involved in everything. This is a big step for leaders to get their heads around, which is, so with those five to six initiatives, I can't be involved in all of them. Uh-oh, uh-oh, you're asking me to let go and trust each other. Like, oh, that's, I say that one of the reasons, one of the times you know you've got trust is if you're squirming. Because if you're squirming, it means that you're, you know, you really are putting a lot of your own exposure in the hands of somebody else. And it's, it's, it's a horrible feeling, but it's a great feeling as well. You know what I mean? Like it's a source of growth. It's like getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. But this step of appointing, for example, and I think it's on my next slide, appointing two team members to lead each of those initiatives. So if you're on a leadership team of say eight to 10 people and there's five to six initiatives, will basically appoint two people per initiative to be the sponsor, not to lead it, to be the sponsor. We'll talk about that, what the difference is in a minute. But that means that I'll be on one team, but I won't have any direct influence on the others. That is challenging, especially for verifiers who you know, are skeptical by nature and want to sort of get into the details of everything else going on. And it's like, nope, you're just going to have to trust. We'll update you. There's room for you to inject your ideas. It's not that you can't have anything to do with it, but in terms of the day-to-day -day involvement, leadership, day-to-day um, -day knowledge, you're going to have to trust. And one of the things I love about this is because it's one thing to have the trust, the foundations of trust with those protocols, like assuming positive intent, but it's another to put it to work. And setting up these initiatives like this and structured this way puts trust into play straight away. And it's really very powerful to, to be called to practice it straight away like this. It is a game changer in a team. So then what you want to do, um, most leaders want to be involved with these initiatives. You can see them sort of saying, well, you know, I'm on the hook for this, so I want to lead it. I want to be involved in steering the direction of it, making holding people accountable, making it happen. It's like, nope, 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 not going there. This is the time for you to rise above that and get more strategic yourself, and instead look for the high potential people beneath you, give them an opportunity to step up, get more visibility, get more experience, and, and have an opportunity to do something that is cross-functional themselves. You know, what, what a fantastic opportunity for your high potentials, and what a great opportunity for you as a mentor, not just to mentor your own people, but how good would it be if you were mentor mentoring people from another initiative as well? So just even doing an inventory of who are our high potentials, I can assure you, and I'm sure this doesn't surprise most of you, just doing the inventory cross-functionally, so you know across our group, who are our high potentials, just that is an insightful discussion for most teams we work with. Like how many people, so I can tell you that, you know, um, the high potentials generally account for no more than 10% of um, the organization. So if you had under your next layer, if you had say a group of eight to 10 people now in the leadership team and you had up to a hundred people underneath them across the board, you might find you know, 10 to maybe 15 high potentials, maybe. You know? Now, if you had a lot more than that, I'd question what your criteria was. And if you didn't have as many, maybe you're being too harsh. Um, but maybe you do have a lot of high potentials. I had one leader that said to me, everyone's a high potential or they wouldn't be on my team. I'm like, mm -hmm. 
okay, well, I'd like to get to meet them, you know, and see, that's my own eight and verifier skepticism coming out right there. But, you know, even some of that team mapping that I shared with you on the last call, um, the last webinar series around how to map people, say so you've got strategic and tactical on one axis and their EQ on another, and, and you start mapping people that way, just the mapping of them and determining, having a discussion around who our high potentials are, that could be hugely valuable for, for the team, let alone what you then start to do with it. But I'm really suggesting that you have those high potentials become the leaders of each initiative and you would stay as a sponsor above that to provide a more strategic oversight rather than the, the day-to-day -day management and leadership of each initiative. So then you've also got to think about not just your sponsors, but if it is cross-functional, we now need to look at who else do we need to invite? What other groups do we need to include in these particular initiatives? So when you do that, this, this is where you bring in some of the intelligent teaming elements from the ID discussion we've had previously, which is, have we got a balance of people? Like we want a balance of IDs. So when we, when we look at who all our high potentials are and we look at who all those other stakeholder groups are, what are the IDs? If we have the IDs, what are the IDs of those people? Do we need to get it? Well, we do need to get a balance of gender if, if it's appropriate. Um, Geo representation, like, you know, we say we're a global company, but how come everyone here is, you know, from the West Coast of the US, for example, you know, um, which still happens. So have we got proper representation from around the world? And are we even, you know, time zone sensitive in how we do this? Have we got all relevant functions represented? So just, just doing that is breakthrough thinking and action um, compared to what I normally see. Most people go, um, well, we need to get this off the ground, so let's get moving. And um, we need a few other people, so we'll just go and grab them. But they don't step back and sort of think, have we got the right balancing here? Have we got the right seniority for the type of work and the, and the decisions? And if you've got a VP from one group and, and someone not a VP from another, you might struggle to retain that VP because I'll say, well, I'm the only person on here at that level. I don't want to spend my time there if no one else is going to be at that level. So you get those sorts of dynamics playing out. And, and as a sponsor, you might have to manage a lot of that. Then you bring in, um, you know, some of the I, specific ID elements. And I would say to you, you want to get someone who's a completer and you want it led by an avoid verifier because avoid verifiers are your natural collaborators. Um, and I put here two people and we, we, we propose um, and recommend a concept of having a pilot and co-pilot, literally like in the cockpit of a plane. So someone is the pilot, but if they're not available for a meeting, it doesn't hijack the rhythm because the co-pilot attends. The two of them fly that plane. And I think that's a really smart way of designing the, um, the, you know, the support for each initiative. But think about this. I just thought I'd throw this up and show you if we had a team, and this is the top two layers of an organization. This is a real organization. And you can see we were setting up um, these cross-functional initi initiatives. And on this page, you'd say, where are our completers? If we were looking for completers, and I'm not saying to you that there's like, you know, eight or nine people here, we, we grab every single one of those. Maybe not all of them are available. Not, maybe not all of them have got the credibility in the team or the knowledge of that initiative to do it. But what I'm doing, first of all, is just flagging who are our more assertive completers. I've specifically not put a circle around some completers, just to make the point that just because you're a completer doesn't mean you've got the confidence or the assertiveness to, ste to, to step up and, and be challenging in the team. Because if you think about the complete drive, it's all about harmony and, and fitting in and wanting to have everything nice and cohesive. So if you're in a, in a discussion and you, you're the only one with a particular opinion, you, you've got to have the confidence and the courage to stand up and present that and stay strong to that. And so as a completer, you know, will you call that out? So there are some completers that will and some that might still be gaining their confidence or might need some real support to do that. So I'm just, you know, proposing here to you, the ones with the circle might be the more assertive and confident people. So we might look at them and say, oh, Monica, that's good to know, or Pete or Brooke. Yeah, let's get those people involved. And then if you look at, the avoid verifiers. So I've colored some people here who are, or yeah, a couple of them who are fives, because a five will do, a five, if I think about how the, the ID works, a five in verify, they're, they're naturally collaborative as well. 
So all these people here that are circled in red are the people that are more naturally collaborative. And that's not to say that a verifier or a, I'll just pick, you know, fill up the top there. That's not to say that he wouldn't be collaborative, um, but it's much more natural and in the, in the bones of an avoid verifier to reach out. You know, even, even me putting this webinar together as a verifier, I was thinking about this yesterday. I sit down and I think it all through and I just grab all the experiences that I've had doing this work across a whole bunch of teams and put this together. Putting, you know, all of that prior work was collaborating with my team, but when I came to put this together, I just put it together. If I was an avoid verifier, the, my first instinct would be to probably pull a team together to put this together, you know? So if you look at the team like this, your chart and say, who have I got? And then map it to your own experience of those people. So you might look at David here, that's five, six, two, seven, and sort of go, mm, I don't see him. Like he might have the instinct to be a collaborator, but I'm not seeing that in him right now. Okay, don't choose him then. Or, or go and have a discussion to uncover why aren't you seeing it, you know? Um, but some of these people will stand out on the work we've done, and I've shared that in prior webinars, we have seen that collaboration teams that are led by a naturally collaborative leader or set of leaders are the ones that are generally more successful. So if you've got a person that's wired to collaborate and you've got people who are the strong assertive completers, and then you've got that balancing of all those other criteria there, you are absolutely set up for success. Any questions? Is it making sense? This, this is, I mean, I, I just think this is awesome thinking and framework to, you know, and it's new, it's new material for leaders. When you go through this with leaders, that it's, it's not telling them what they already knew. It's, it's what they knew almost intuitively, but they didn't have a way of doing it. Now this gives them a process to follow. Ian, do we have any questions or comments from the team? We're good. All quiet, Paul. Okay, thank you. All right, guys, so um, I just thought when you look at our culture here, you know, in terms of, I think that was it. Oh, no, this one, sorry. I was just going to show you that collaboration in this team, this, this is that team that I just showed you, this one here, this is their culture. So you can see with that strong verified bias, this isn't a team that if we, if we let all of the leaders up the top here, like take that, L, that layer that Brooke is on up the top. There's, you know, um, if Gail and Brian and Larry and Ed and Steve, or the people at the top like Phil, took on leadership roles, and you might be tempted to give them that role because of their seniority, the seniority isn't what we're looking for here. We want to see natural collaboration energy. And you can see in a bunch of these teams, like the team under Gail, Look at the amount of verify there or the team under Ed, it's just so many verifiers. And so they might actually want to call on people, you know, they might be doing an initiative where it would be smart to maybe call someone else or even look down beneath that team. Who have we got underneath here that might have, you know, more diverse drives that we could call on. Um, so that to me would be, you know, um, a smart way to take this forward. Now, Grant, to your question, so I don't forget it, um, what do we do if we don't have the ID of the people? Without the, you know, you could still map on like a two by two, um, who are the people that are strategic, like on one axis is the people who are strategic and the people who are tactical. And on the other axis, you go, who are the people who are collaborative and non-collaborative, like collaborative and say siloed. And just map those people, right? And even though you don't know their ID, you will see, you, you know, you're gonna have people that fall in probably all four quadrants. And so the people who are strategic and naturally collaborative, they're, they're people you might choose for like a more of a leadership role. The people who are collaborative and tactical might be the people you want to have a look at on a, you know, on belonging to the team. And then you, you can do your own sense or assessment of who are my high potentials. Um, so you, could, you can make a lot of headway, a lot of intelligent teaming thinking can still be sprinkled into this, even if you don't know their ID. The part that's missing, even though they might look collaborative, it, let's say, for example, um, I'll use two examples here, just using this chart. Let's say it was Ed on that top line there that 
that showed up in your top right hand quadrant that was a, one of your strategic natural collaborators his id is not a natural collaborator and so i'd be sort of thinking okay how am i defining collaboration i saw one i had a leader like this um one time his name was brian and he was in this meeting and he prided himself on being a collaborator and when i observed him in the meeting i could see why he saw that about himself because he he does a lot of talking in the meeting but he does a lot of talking he wasn't really listening and and so he would listen to other people but then he just keep you know pressing his own agenda so he had a lot of discussion but you know my measure for collaboration this is how i measure myself on collaboration is the outcome different to my agenda that's how that's how simple it is for me if i go in believing that the answer is seven and i come out going well I thought it was seven, but I spoke with Ian about it and I can now see the answers 12 and I'm running with 12. That's a good sign of collaboration. Because I've truly embraced the input from the team, from the team think and the team discussion. So that's my measure. So if I was looking at are people collaborative, one simple way is can I see examples where they've been willing to shift like on a dime, like in the meeting, They've heard the views of others and they're going, okay, okay, I hear what you're saying. Okay, let's go with that then. That's a good sign of collaboration, skill and energy. Does that help, Grant? Yeah, it does. Yeah, Thanks, Paul. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. And then I'm just aware of the time here, guys. Um, the last point I've had is once you've got all the teams designed, then you have to do the normal team development work that you would do in a silo team so you've now formed your very intelligent cross-functional team you've got your key initiatives all of the top seven points set up the last thing you then need to do but it's ongoing is you need to do the normal you know you've done the forming so now it's about the norming the storming the performing journey that you would take a normal team through and that's you know generally if you've already got id and some of the protocols in there as a language you will you'll will go through those stages much much faster than when you did it in your functional teams but you still need to go through that process there still needs to be the norming and the good governance around those cross-functional teams and the accountability around those teams so when you are thinking about things like reporting out the performance of our of our business you would have a report out on the initiative teams just as you would have a report out on your silo teams that accountability, that governance, the same processes for onboarding and transitions on and off teams, because those teams are gonna have transitions as well. You know, um, it, they get the same attention. So when you think about, I've got, as a leader, I've got, you know, eight to 10 direct reports. I'm proposing that as a leader, you would have eight to 10 direct reports and five to six cross-functional initiatives, and you would be providing a report out on all of them and, your results and your contribution would be, you know, potentially say 10 to 20 X or beyond what it would have otherwise been. And that is the great untapped potential to me that still awaits the, the real, you know, the leaders of tomorrow. We've got a couple of minutes left. If anyone has any questions or comments that you'd like to share. All right, team. Well, if 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 we're done, I hope I hope you found that insightful. Um, if you have any feedback, given there hasn't been much chat here, I I don't find it hard to do all the talking. But I hope this has been educational and insightful, and and gives you, if not an entire framework, because I know some of you may not be working where you need an entire framework like this. But it may just give you some clues that you could grab. You know, just some pieces, like even right at the outset, the piece around having as a mindset that there's a, a need to be vertical, a need to be horizontal, not just vertical, you know, um, or the need to specifically address having your own agendas and, and having a trade-off discussion around what we're gonna let go of. Just that could be something that, you know, you each take away. So 
I hope you found that useful. Thank you so much for being on the call. These, this recording and the deck will be posted on, onto our website. So if you know of others who could benefit from this um, same material, please feel free to send them in this direction. Thanks, guys, and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Bye, team. Cheers. Cheers, Paul.